A world of worry, a world of change, a world of lives rearranged, joined together in song. We are one, we are one. We have doubts, we have fears, we share the hurt, we share the tears. We are here, we're not alone. We are one, we are one, we are one, we are one. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, David. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me uh, in the green room still. Wonderful. Um, hopefully, our viewers can hear uh, me out there as well. And uh, uh, I trust that you enjoy that song there, sung by David, uh, our guest today. And uh, I'd like to uh, start with a um, an introduction there, but 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 before we do that, uh, welcome, folks. Welcome to another episode of uh, Conversations with Dune and Friends. Today we have a wonderful friend joining us from all the way from Calgary, Alberta. Right where you guys normally at this time would be hosting the uh, the greatest outdoor show on earth, uh, as they say. And uh, uh, but because you're not having stampede this year due to COVID, where you have some time to join us, uh, uh, David. And uh, let me do a quick introduction uh, before we. Uh, we uh, get David on screen here. And uh, I just need to uh, do a quick share here so that uh, everybody can uh, sort of know where to access this video here. So uh, so let me just go ahead and do that. And uh, one more thing here. Um, you know, all of this social media stuff, um, one day we're gonna have a crew doing this, but until then, <laughs> just kidding. Until then, um, this, uh, this is it, this is it. So again, welcome and uh, let me do an introduction of David here. And uh, if one of my our viewers out there could do me a favor and just confirm that you're able to hear the sound, that would be fantastic. Because uh, 
I think this show works slightly better with sound. If you can hear us, it might be slightly more interesting. So, so uh, do let us know, folks. Uh, okay. So David, uh, David Saxby, uh, an international professional speaker for over 35 years, delivers keynotes and seminars and workshops. Uh, as a speaker, his presentations focus on innovative sales and marketing strategies. Uh, he has helped thousands of businesses achieve uh, significant growth, uh, even during difficult economic times. He is a marketing and sales strategist, uh, director, um, uh, really creative director. Uh, David started a one-man creative studio at the age of 23 and, and grew that uh, firm uh, through uh, major recessions and, and in three years uh, really to a full-service marketing firm with 20 staff applying the an innovative uh, business strategy. Uh, uh, over the past 40 years, he has successfully uh, built several other marketing ventures. Now, David is a founding member, a uh, past president of the Calgary chapter uh, and the past national director of CAPS, uh, Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. He has been a board member of a, a number of not-for-profit organizations. Uh, David is an author uh, of five books, five folks, five, five, and has been quoted uh, as an expert in numerous uh, business publications on, on radio and TV. He's also a guitar player, folks, a guitar player and a vocalist, and an actor and an artist and, and a motorcycle rider. And currently is the chair of the Motorcycle Ride for Dad. So with that brief introduction, uh, please help me, folks, in welcoming our guest today all the way from Calgary, David Saxby. David, welcome. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm excellent, Dune. Good to see you. Good, good to connect. To, good to see you. So, good to uh, see you. You heard the uh, music over the um, when I played at the beginning, I presume. I yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. It was good. Good, yeah. good music. Excellent, excellent music. So, tell us a bit more about uh, your background before we get into a conversation here for an hour and a bit over the lunch hour here. Um, Tell us, how, how did David get here beyond the bio? Maybe fill in the blanks a bit. Uh, tell us a few uh, sort of interesting tidbits along the way that takes us from uh, uh, where you were born to, to now. Anything at all? Yeah, well, the uh, the music thing, which uh, you did hear a, a song that I did uh, recently with uh, a fellow named uh, Jason McCoy out of Ontario. He's our uh, national spokesperson for the Motorcycle Ride for Dad. And uh, we raise money for prostate cancer research and awareness. So he put a challenge out to all of the chapter leaders to record his song. And then we did a national concert, of course, live on Facebook across Canada. So that was the challenge that I had. And uh, just to go back in my life a little bit, I originally, back when I was a teenager, uh, well, in fact, even earlier than that, I played in the high school band, the junior high school band. Uh, and as a teenager, um, I was really intrigued and interested in rock and roll and actually uh, went to a music conservatory and started learning guitar at a very young age, 14 years old. Decided that that was going to be a career for me. It was uh, uh, In those days, I actually had hair, so I was a long-haired hippie uh, rock and roller. <laughs> and, <laughs> so uh, I got into the music industry and... Uh, uh, a short while after I joined the music conservatory, they asked me if I would teach some uh, some of the kids uh, music, and we had a competition which was held up in Edmonton, and the uh, students that I was teaching were to perform there, much like the Kiwanis Festival. Many people are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. So I got this group together, and uh, they were performing, uh, practicing, I should say, and we got uh, into the practices. The day before the concert, I got a phone call, and one of the other people in the group said, um, our singer's lost his voice, and so we don't have a singer, and we need a singer to compete. You have to sing for us. There you go. Well, at that point in my life, I'd never sung in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, worse than that, it was the night before the concert, so I had to memorize the song, went up mm -hmm. to the concert. Uh, there were 650 of my peers and, and students in the audience. <laughs> we had never rehearsed together, even though we I taught them and they performed. Mm -hmm. I got on the stage, we we're uh, performing the first verse, 
got into the second verse part way and the sound cut. Oh no. All that was left was my voice and a set of drums <laughs> that we were doing back in the USSR by the Beatles. Oh, that, that works. That works. You can, you can make yeah, that up. Yeah. <laughs> so I walked off the stage that day and I said, screw the music career. It's too difficult, too <laughs> stressful. And uh, told myself I'd never get in front of an audience again. Yeah. In other words, so, you, uh, you learn a little bit of respect for the people that, uh, um, that puts on a show that seems so easy and, and uh, things do go wrong from time to time. Yeah. So from there, uh, I also had another interest and, and uh, career choice, and that was advertising. I was uh, very blessed at a young age to have some talent, and a few people told me you should pursue a career where you can use your talent. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got into college and learned advertising and then wound up in the industry working as a freelance creative person. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, very quickly grew my business, like literally from one person to six people within three years mm -hmm. and uh, formed a full service agency. <clears throat> but at the time when I was building my business, I was always nervous when I went out to do presentations. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, if there's any way I'm going to be successful, I better learn how to be a better presenter. Mm -hmm. So I took a speaking course through the JCs, Junior Chamber of Commerce. Uh, finished the speaking course, got into the Second year, the fellow leading the program said, I want you to lead the program. And I said, no, I'm an advertising guy. I don't <laughs> do presentations. <laughs> and he said, well, how about we lead it together? And I said, yeah, we could do that. So we led the program together at the end of the, the second year. He said, uh, well, he says, you're leading the next program. And I said, hold on a second here. I told you already, I'm not really interested in being a presenter. And he says, well, you don't have a choice. And I, he said, why is that? And uh, he said, because you're the only guy that knows the program and I'm leaving the country. <laughs> that was my introduction to speaking. Yeah. So I wound up training volunteers across the country. And then I wound up getting people approach me and say, uh, hey, would you do a presentation to our group, our company, and so on? Mm -hmm. And I remember the first paid gig I got back in 1983. Mm -hmm. They said, uh, what do you charge? Mm -hmm. and I went, oh, my God. At that time, I was a consultant. And mm -hmm. so I charged them 50 bucks to do a keynote. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I charged that fee. <laughs> <laughs> well, although that was many, many, uh, that was many years ago. So 50 bucks might have uh, buy a few more things back then than it does now. Well, it was a good fee in those days, but I'll tell you, it was a lot of work. <laughs> as you know, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. from there, what happened was I grew the, the agency fairly quickly because I'd go out and present to audiences of business people and I get people approaching me about doing business. Mm -hmm. Then the, the a big recession hit in '83. I, I don't know if you were around. Yeah. Uh, in That's the, when I came to Canada, my friend. January 1983. I came just in time for the recession, just to set yeah. my expectations a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? Of course, as you know, uh, businesses were going bankrupt, and because I was in the advertising industry, what happened was we had a how agencies made their money is they took a commission on the media sold. Mm -hmm. So if they bought television campaigns, then they, you know, spend a hundred, 200, half a million dollars, whatever on a campaign, take 15% of that. And that's how they paid their overhead, their staff and profit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, as the recession hit, what happened, the media started approaching clients directly and cutting the fees down. So agencies were going from 15% commission down to 3%. And uh, I saw I saw that whole thing, and I I wound up downsizing my office to myself and an assistant, uh, cut my office space down, uh, gave gave away the condo, and uh, and uh, had to sell the BMW because everybody in those days needed a BMW. That's right, it's a necessity. <laughs> necessity. And I looked at the whole situation. I said, "Well, okay, that's not working. What can I do?" Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I looked at the industry. I looked out. I looked at uh, what wasn't working. Uh, also, the other thing that was happening at that time is agencies uh, were independent of PR firms, graphic design houses, printers, and so on. So everybody was uh, spread out, and clients didn't have the time to go to each of those different services, so they uh, were looking for everything under one house. So I brought all of the services in-house. Yeah. And uh, at that time, very fortunately, we went to a fee-for-service as opposed to a commission, and I looked around at what was going on in the business marketplace and discovered that lawyers for the very first time, uh, professionals in general, 
were given the opportunity to advertise for the first time. Mm. So myself and my partners uh, looked at that and said, okay, there's an opportunity because our structure is exactly like a professional service firm. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I, you know, if you heard my bio, that's when I went from the uh, basically two person operation up to uh, 23 people in a very short period of time, year and a half. And then I sold that and uh, I was doing speaking and that's how I attracted business mm -hmm. was I'd go out, do presentations, bring clients in. And then uh, when I sold the business, I flipped that formula around and used my marketing skills to build a speaking business. And so that's that's my life today. I still consult and I still speak and I do some coaching as well. Mm -hmm. well, well wonderful. Now, uh, so so the music has always. Uh, when did you start playing music? When, when did that be it became a thing in your life? Very early on, or somewhere later on in life? Yeah, actually, uh, well, my mom played piano. Mm -hmm. She had her grade ten in piano. And she played piano. My grandma played piano, and so they always encouraged me to sing along with them. Mm. And at age seven, uh, my parents gave me an accordion mm -hmm. and I think I played it for three months and said, okay, I can't stand the sound. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got into high school and I wound up playing trombone mm. and played that up until uh, a couple of years into college. But in the interim, I'd picked up guitar mm -hmm. and so at age 14, I started playing guitar and that yeah. was, that was kind of my passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, it might be a, a good thing to uh, maybe start with that. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of uh, the business side of things and get into some details and, and, and have you maybe share some lessons learned and, uh, you know, marketing and business and, and in entrepreneurship and, and company building and things like that. But but maybe before we um, get into that, I'd like to maybe play a video. Uh, and uh, this is a video, um, actually, it combines the music but uh, with also the speaking side of thing because it's actually at a caps event that you kind of did this here at caps social so tell us about this video before i roll it here david i'm thinking about the one with um, chuck a uh, friend chuck rose who's also a caps member go ahead yeah well uh, interesting enough i've known chuck for 30 years um, we met a number of years ago when he had uh, a restaurant in downtown calgary mm -hmm. and uh, we got talking about music and he said well you know why don't why don't we get together and and uh do some singing and playing some songs and stuff. And uh, so I hadn't been really doing much music up until that point. And we got together and for the convention, um, I was co-chair of the convention. And so we, uh, Chuck uh, had written a theme song for the convention. And I said, I'd love to perform with you. And, and so that's how that happened. Yeah. And that was 2016. That was the convention. Right, right. So I'm going to uh, bring it up and I'm going to share it to uh, for our viewers to uh, to watch here. It's a, a fairly uh, short clip, so we'll run the whole thing here. And uh, you know, what's interesting too is the song title is called "We Are One." Hmm. So the song that you just heard on the beginning of this uh, interview was "We Are One" by Jason McCoy. This one's written by Chuck Rose. There you go. So uh, it's a common sentiment. Uh, oh, okay. This is actually the video of uh, Stampede Week in Calgary. Our yeah. cat together. So yeah, that's yeah. a different video. Yeah, oh, different go. video. Okay. Well, we're yeah. going to play this one. Uh, so um, sure. let me just uh, go ahead and take myself out of the uh, mix here and uh, go ahead and uh, make that happen. And uh, all right. Well, let me know if you can hear the sound. No, there's no sound. That's because I need to do this. Smell the there we go. Tina's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought Tina was our, our Caps Calgary president. So yeah, that's yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always been my passion uh, to uh, play. And uh, about five years ago, I started getting back out and doing some jams at uh, various places. And Chuck and I have jammed together a few times. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Now, we're going to bring up some photos soon, but before we do that, uh, let me ask you this. Think of all of the experience you've had with uh, entrepreneurship and business and whatnot. Do you have uh, an awesome, fantastic highlight story to share? And then do you have a, the opposite story, a low light? Uh, you might have shared uh, some sentiment of that already with the economy there, but I'd love to hear a, a specific story that is a highlight of your career, if you will, um, and then also maybe a low light story if you have one of those. Wow. Well, I've been very fortunate over the years that I've had some some real high highs and some real low lows. Uh, after the recession, building the company up that quickly, literally going from uh, uh, a small organization up to 23 people, uh, we almost imploded simply because things were so, uh, everything happened so quick. And uh, the beauty of that whole situation is it really put our, firm on the map as far as um, being able to provide services for clients. And my lesson learned in that whole situation, though, which goes right back to when I first got into the industry, um, my skill set was creative. And I thought in those days, back in the late 70s, early 80s, that uh, creative was the place to be. What I learned was it was okay to be creative. And in the 70s, you could succeed on having a great advertising campaign and uh, you know, great creative. But after the recession, what happened was many businesses were floundering simply because things had changed quite a bit. We had cable introduced to the world, so we now had multiple channels of everything. And uh, of course, in the 90s, we hit into, well, late, 90, uh, late 80s and early 90s, we hit the internet. So what I realized uh, a part way into my career, especially after I built the large agencies, was it was more important to be innovative in other words being able to be creative but Im implementing the creativity and having a, a system and a process and be able to implement because that was more sustainable so if, if i was to give advice to business people key thing is come up with a strategy that's innovative that's going to outdo the competition and market that's really my lesson learned and it took me a while to learn it and i had a few uh, failures along the way, um, as you mentioned in my bio, I've started several other companies and I had some successes in the companies, but then the market shifted, we hit some recessions. And so I had to actually close down one or two businesses. And so lesson learned, it was even though we had a good product and even though we had some decent clients, the challenge was the competition became uh, stronger the uh, cost of the goods in, uh, and specifically one was in the wine business. So I was an importer and I also did uh, packaging for the wine industry. So it, uh, it, we hit another recession and of course people weren't buying $80 bottles of wine. And so I basically wound that down a few years ago, just simply because there just wasn't the opportunity there. The margins weren't there and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, so lessons learned. I think I think the the challenge for most businesses is staying relevant, and particularly look at this COVID situation right now. Take a serious look at your business and figure out where the market is and what you need to do to be innovative. Because if you're not innovative, you're not going to survive. Hard work alone is not enough anymore. In fact, no. maybe maybe it never was. <laughs> well, even even having a great product, if you if you're not creative and innovative in how you approach the market and the offers you give, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. I literally, and, and I think I've told you this in my business, I've gone from being a in-person presenter, a mm -hmm. live speaker uh, at conventions and mostly doing keynotes to uh, taking those skills and putting everything online. And I built a, a coaching business over the last year, which is all online. We have resources for people that, uh, are in the webinar format and also uh, e-newsletters. So literally within the last year, when COVID hit, I said, okay, this is the time to push the button and get going. Mm -hmm. And so we built a coaching business online. You bet. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, tell us more about this uh, uh, online stuff. Uh, I want to hear, because to me, it, it, it is a lot of work. And to me, it's... Uh, 
it has a potential upside that is uh, game changing, really. Uh, you know, if we're not on it when we should be on it and, and uh, it, not doing the right things, uh, this is very much a sort of a longevity uh, move, isn't it? Well, I, I think, yeah, sustainability is really the key. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of the challenges I always found when I was in the advertising business and even in the speaking business is okay to go out and do a presentation, but you needed to have something to follow up with. So I, I did speaking, doing keynotes, which would lead me to training, consulting, and coaching. And if I was doing coaching, sometimes that would flip around the other way and lead to having me speak at a convention. So the longevity really comes from figuring out a sustainability model, a way of of being able to continually offer clients something that helps them in their business. And particularly now uh, with the online world, there are a lot of people giving away a lot of good content and a lot of good stuff for free. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, is keeping up with the game and offering something of value where the customers come back and say, you know, that was really great and I got that for free. I wonder what else they do that they charge for or what their fees are and so on and have a conversation. But there is so much out there. I mean, YouTube now, I, I've forgotten what the numbers are, but it's something like you know, five or 10,000 videos go up every hour in <laughs> YouTube. I don't yeah. know what the numbers are these days, but it's a crazy world. So there's not enough, there's not enough good content, I think. Uh, there's lots of content, but you really have to sort through things. So whatever you present online has to be something of high value and uh, that's going to help people now. Right. And I think in the long run, uh, it's going to be, again, back to relationship again. Uh, content is going to be uh, almost taken for granted, to be honest. It, you know, uh, my opinion, uh, you know, some people are going to kind of say, dude, what do you mean? Content is king. Well, yeah, yeah, but maybe no, maybe no. Uh, my thinking is, yeah, you got to have your content. You got to be an expert in all of that. But that's what not 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 necessarily what's going to um retain the business long term uh, you retain the business because that their organizations are complex enough uh, that they they want to sift through the contents and, and and really pinpoint like don't give me 150 videos when you really you listen to me and you give me this three minutes of video that i really need to watch it's the distillation of the content contextualized and focus and so that's that's our job is to actually listen a lot and to understand and to people who bring the the thing in because in my mind the world that we live in contents will be, become kind of like space debris space debris is out there all over the place and our job is not necessarily to create more content our job is to actually really know who it is we're serving and what the problems are and bring in the appropriate content but maybe as importantly to actually filter out the the things that that, that are space debris that are actually damaging to even pay attention to and act upon. So our job is more distillation more than ever before. Now, some of my beer friends that I heard distillation, they probably just you know got excited for a moment there. But but, but you know we distill <laughs> stuff. That and, business. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a slightly different business, but the same idea. You distill it down, right? We need yeah. to be distillers. Well, I, I think even more importantly is to be the. Uh, the filter and the interpreter for information. So as a business consultant and as a speaker and as a uh, coach, my job is yes, to provide some information, to provide content, but more importantly is to also help the, the uh, client figure out what they should be paying attention to when and when to implement it. Because the, the amount of information that's coming at us daily is overwhelming and i know myself i have spent a huge amount of time in the last year ramping up on this whole online world and uh after five hours of sitting on uh <laughs> online videos my brain is mush mm -hmm. so uh, you have to shake some of that out filter it out and go okay what was valuable during that five hours yeah 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 uh... Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some uh, photos in just a moment here, but but tell us about the, uh, the, the so you, you mentioned a little bit about the consulting and whatnot. Tell us about the coaching. Uh, maybe expand on that a little bit. Uh, how does the coaching work? Who do you coach? And, and, you know, how does that play out? Sure. Well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, one of the things I always found is when I did a keynote or even did some training or consulting, is after I left, the client was still left with a situation of, okay, how do I put this into play? And so with the coaching program that I've set up online, 
literally what happens is is uh, I meet with the client, figure out where they're at. And there's three different levels with our coaching. So one is a kind of a do-it-yourself uh, system. So they can literally go in and, and listen to or watch videos. Um, they get an e-newsletter that gives them tips and ideas that they can implement right away. But then I also have a group coaching situation. So several people in a group, five to 10 people, and the same thing, they get information uh, regularly, weekly. Uh, they can watch uh, the uh, videos and so on. But then I will work with them uh, once a month to interpret that and really help them put it into play. And the third level is we have an opportunity where people can actually work with me one-on-one -on, -one on the coaching basis and they still get access to our system. So the system that I have online is actually connected up throughout North America and uh, into areas like Mexico and worldwide in some other countries. And there's literally a library of um, e-newsletters and um, videos and also um, templates that people can actually use and apply to their business. And we've, we've got templates for over 400 different businesses. So we tend, tend to work primarily with small to medium sized businesses. And uh, not that I don't work with large corporations, happy to do that and have done, but a lot of small companies just don't have a marketing or, or sales department big enough to be able to do their own uh, marketing planning and strategy. So, so that's the part that I always found was missing over the years that I've been in the speaking training business and also in the consulting, uh, marketing consulting business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you to maybe reflect and reminisce on some of these uh, photos here. Uh, these are all um, speaking related. Tell us the stories that come with some of these uh, these photos. Now, some of these photos might have a similar story as others, so we can certainly uh, sort of skip over them and, and, uh, and you know tell stories in other photos. But uh, as the photos come up, now we have not prepared for you for this, so that you are going to be on the cuff here. <laughs> whatever, whatever story or whatever things come to mind, uh, tell us about it. So here's the first photo of a few. Well, that was at an event called the Business Boost, and uh, the aim was to help uh, businesses. This was just after the 2009 uh, crash. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my presentation there was about innovation and really helping business owners and business managers figure out how to be more innovative and mm -hmm. giving them a, a concept around a model that they could work around to be more innovative. So, and that was in Edmonton, by the way. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. Hey, just a reminder to our viewers out there, feel free to uh, uh, comment and, and uh, ask David questions and uh, put them on the hot seat if you have to or if you want to. That, that might be fun for a little bit. Not, not too hot, but uh, <laughs> so um, cool. Thank you for sharing that, David. Let's uh, look at the next photo here. Oh, that's, uh, that's the CAPS National Board, the year that I was on the National Board. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's all of the board members that were were there at the convention. Hey, when did you join CAPS, uh, David? Uh, well, actually, I helped found CAPS, and that mm -hmm. was in 1996. We mm -hmm. uh, were all members of National Speakers Association in the States before CAPS was formed. And so there was a bunch of us got together and talked about the idea of having a Canadian association. And in 1996, we formed the Calgary group and then there was a group in Toronto already established. And so we built the organization up to a size where we were able to start CAPS as an independent association uh, with our sister organization in NSA. NSA being, uh, in this case, <laughs> National Speakers Association rather than the other NSA, uh, uh, several other NSAs. Yeah, uh, nothing so to do with spying on people. <laughs> there you go. It's this uh, to inspire and to. Uh, um, yeah, we, now, we inspired, not spied. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you know, but I've joined CAPS much later, much later, uh, 2010. So it's been 10 years now. Oh. Uh, I'm going to my 11th convention, hopefully, when if COVID stabilizes uh, and there isn't a uh, second wave and whatever, in Calgary, in, in your. You know, hometown, my friend, we're going to be uh, yeah. all, you know, com coming back to Calgary for another Calgary Caps convention. December. December, as I always, every year. And um, yeah. Tell us about this one. 
Oh, that's, I think, the following year um, being involved in the board nationally. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Lots of, uh, there you are in your debonair looking kind of um, hairstyle. and <laughs> <laughs> Or lack of work. <laughs> oh, you, you know, um, the, uh, what is it, uh, handkerchief was, uh, you know, very uh, well in place. I noticed you don't have one on today. Is it the sign of the time, David? Is it handkerchiefs are going out? Is that it? <laughs> I think it, it really de depended on formality. This was a formal dinner uh, when I was in the wine tasting, well, in the wine business. I was an importer, but I also did wine tastings to educate people on wine and introduce my products. And this was with the Italian Chamber of Commerce, which is across Canada. There you go. Uh, so I introduced uh, some Italian wines that we had imported into Canada. You play the part that that, that would look like some uh, some guy that I would buy, buy some uh, Italian wine from. You know, it looks like you could be in a movie, an European movie of some sort with subtitles. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that kind of look, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, you know, yeah, it's it's very almost European looking. I say there you are again. The Same wine tasting, yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your thought on that? You know, Gary V. Gary uh, Vaynerchuk is into wine now. Uh, of course, always been with his dad's business there. Do you follow that at all? Do you know what he's up to? <laughs> yeah, I've read a number of his books. Um, a, a brilliant strategy. Remember, I was talking about strategy and innovation. Uh -huh. you know, back when Gary was still working in his dad's wine shop, they were doing fairly well. I mean, they were selling a million dollars worth of wine a year, I think. Yeah. And but he realized that in order to sell more and make more revenue, he had to actually educate people. And so he started out a, a, a separate business called Wine TV, where he literally got online and did videos and presented different wines and talked to people about wine tasting. Yeah. And uh, that blew it out of the water. I think his first couple of years after that, he was up to four million dollars. And I have no idea where he's at now with yeah. his business, but uh, yeah. So yeah. very interesting strategy in the wine business. So, so again, again, what I draw from that is when it comes to marketing, an indirect approach is often a better approach. Well, and, and uh, this gets back to another point in marketing as well, and that is um, educating our customers so that when they're at a point of buying, they're already familiar with, with what they need to think about. Mm -hmm. You've helped them interpret the information to narrow it down. Yes. And you become the preferred supplier, the preferred person that they're going to work with, simply because you've helped them through the process all all the time. And that's why I found the wine business is the more I talk to people about, you know, quality wines and, and the tasting and presenting different wines, they all of a sudden, it opened up their world as to what other choices they had. You bet, you bet. You know, uh -huh. similar, in the, similar in the consulting world where, again, I, I used to have a lot of employees, uh, 12 employees, management consultants, and we would do a uh, request for proposal response to them. Uh, and uh, sometimes sometimes you get RFI, request for information, right? Uh, and the reason we respond to some RFI is because we actually see our, maybe an opportunity to, um, uh, to influence their thinking in, in you know, what a, uh, awesome solution would be. Uh, so we ask them questions. We, we we you know give them some info and insights and whatnot. And often by reading you know not not just our submission but other people's submission, other vendors' submission, they probably come to a, a more cl clearer approach, a, a clearer definition of what it is that they're looking for. And so so we sort of participate in that uh, that forming their you know kind of their thinking a little bit early on, right? Yeah, and I think very good point. I mean. When a client throws out an RFI, they're fishing. Mm -hmm. you know, they're looking for everything out there. So if you can be the one person that interprets what the customer should be looking for, the client should be looking for, and help them decide, even though they may not choose you, mm -hmm. you're much better at a, a, a putting yourself into a position where they might come back to you and say, you know what, you've been so helpful, we want to hire you, what can we do? Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes they might come back and say, well, we don't have the budget for what you proposed. Other times they may say, well, uh, you know, timing's not right, but can we consider you next year? That type mm -hmm. of thing. So there's lots of things that happen in an RFI and RFP process. Yeah, here you are at the Calgary Telus Convention Center. I've spoken in there a number of times and uh, quite a cool place too, hey? Yeah, yeah, great facility for sure. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I actually do work uh, also with not-for-profit organizations and 
Um, a lot of times they fail to realize that um, even though they're not for profit doesn't mean they can't make money. Mm. It just means their money goes back to their their members and their community instead mm. of the CEO's pocket mm -hmm. <laughs> or yeah, yeah. the staff's pocket sort of thing. But uh, so I've worked a lot with, with uh, not-for-profit organizations to simply help them figure out how to market themselves and also how to work with their audience so that they support their cause. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did actually chair an organization in Calgary at one time with the Chamber of Commerce, and it was called the Business of the Arts uh, Committee. And the same thing in the arts, they're not for profit in many cases. And we basically put on forums and, and sessions for them that talk to them about, you know, okay, you think you're not for profit, but you still have to make profit to be able to afford to support the organizations you're part of. Mm -hmm. So turning into a business thinking organization. Yeah, there you are. So <laughs> tell me, tell me, what do you enjoy more, speaking or coaching or building the marketing business from the behind the sort of uh, in the background kind of thing, masterminding it? Uh, what do you find the most enjoyment in? I, I know you're good at all of those things. I know you do whichever mix is appropriate based on the economy and everything at the right time. Uh, but tell me, if you had to, to pick one that says, you know, that I really enjoy that more than the others, uh, is there one? That's a tough choice. Mm. I, I do enjoy speaking from the perspective that I love helping people learn and, and I love helping people see the potential for what they're doing and and God knows if I had attended more presentations back when I first started in business I probably wouldn't have gone through the recessions mm -hmm. uh, the way I did mm -hmm. I did actually back in the 80s I wound up on a fast track after the first recession learning everything I could about business in general and so I thought the best way for me to be helpful to clients was to get out to large audiences and talk to people about everything related to how to promote their business. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a tough choice because I, I find uh, the speaking business can be really challenging, especially in times like this, and especially when you've got things like travel restrictions and all sorts of issues around it. It can be very exhausting, but I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoy helping clients develop strategies because many times uh, I see clients that are stuck and I, I push them through that and help them figure out what's the best strategy for their market. And actually tell you a little short story about a client we worked with who was all, already a fairly successful, a multi-million dollar company. And uh, I did a presentation, this is in Fort McMurray, it just shortly after the, uh, the uh, downturn in Fort McMurray when the oil business took a, a dive. <clears throat> and I wound up, um, I did a keynote, then I did a breakout, and afterwards, several people came up to chat with me. One of the girls, uh, ladies that was in the audience, came up to me and handed me her business card, and she said, uh, do you do any consulting? And I said, absolutely. So we chatted, and uh, she said, I think we could use your help. And I looked at her business card, the back of the business card, had 15 logos, 15 different names, and 15 colors, color schemes mm -hmm. for all the different divisions or, or different companies they owned. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I say, very successful company. They were doing all right. But I, I looked at her and I said, let me guess. When you meet a prospective client, you spend half your sales time explaining what the heck this is. <laughs> and she said, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what I'm going to recommend is we visit the idea of creating a cohesive single brand for all of the operations and then putting them underneath as just services you provide. So we did that. We went through a process a year and a half investigating the options for uh, a brand brand development, mm -hmm. uh, did interviews, did calls, uh, did forum groups and discussions, came back with a brand. Interesting enough, uh, their market grew by $130 million within a year mm. as a result. No, I, I'm not saying the brand did the, made the difference, but mm -hmm. all of a sudden conversations with potential clients became much easier. Mm -hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. uh, Dave, one of your music uh, buddies there is uh, calling you out to uh, calling out to you to come to a jam at the Higher Ground Cafe. I've been there. I had uh, some some business meetings with some of my colleagues oh. there at the Higher Ground Cafe. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's a bit kind of our artistic or in the, in the environment yeah. that they create almost like you are at the art gallery, not an art gallery, but, but most, some sort of an artsy place, right? 
Well, it's uh, yeah, it's in Kensington, which is much like uh, the 87, 82nd Avenue area. Right, in, White Avenue here. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of that uh, artsy community. And uh, so would that be my buddy, Al Barrett? You bet. Uh, Alan Barrett. Yeah. And Alan, you get a prize for being the first uh, viewer to comment <laughs> live. So, so keep it uh, going, my friend, and keep it going. Uh, other folks who are watching, feel free to chime in and, and join the conversation here. So, so David, uh, tell us about this this next photo here, which I will make larger for, so that you can see uh, what we're talking about here. Um, yeah, tell us about this one. Oh, that's you, just one of my speaker photos that I used for promotion a few yeah. years ago. So, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Is that a cat's speaking, pin on there? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's a lavalier mic, but I was yeah. actually speaking at the CAPS convention in Toronto when that picture was taken. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that shirt could very well be your performance, music performance shirt there, my friend. It has the <laughs> artsy thing going for it. You got the sort of juxtaposition between the, the black suit uh, jacket there and, and this this very cool artsy uh, kind of <laughs> shirt there. Well, great. Um, there you go. You're doing some magical marketing stuff, right? Yeah. Well, it, it was interesting a few years ago. I, I needed to... Uh, ramp up my marketing and um, shortly after one of the recessions that we've had and I needed to create something that really had an impact so I, I came with, up with the theme of uh, Ignite Innovation and of course this was my promo video or promo shot for that so mm -hmm. that's where that came from it was one of my speaker promo shots back when I started the launch of uh, Ignite Innovation. Fantastic. I was so focused on the ignited uh, innovation there and uh, that I uh, my little wireless keyboard sitting on my lap here was just uh, sliding off and uh, gravity took I over. Gravity, <laughs> you, gravity took over. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, um, you know, in terms of the uh, there you are in another marketing shot and uh, different colors. Yeah. Now, oh, uh, I think I click uh, once too many times. This must be uh, overseas, right? You mentioned, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I had the, had the uh, opportunity. I received a, a contact from a fellow who organizes conferences in Iran uh, back in 2009, this is a few years ago now. And he approached me and asked me if I'd come over. They were doing a, a marketing and sales conference over there, if I'd be interested in going there and speaking. So. I said, yes, and uh, at that time, there was a lot of uh, conflict going on between the U.S. and Iran in particular. In fact, it was around the time of the nukes issue, mm. and so I was a little nervous in going at first and, and uh, checked things out and had to get a special passport to enter the country, but myself and five other speakers from around the world uh, attended this this series of conferences. We literally... I was there nine days and I spoke five times at five different conferences throughout the country. And, and I have to say it was, it was quite an experience because as I spoke, I had simultaneous translation. Mm. And so I remember okay. the first one I did, the, I, I was speaking and I was pausing, waiting for translation. And the, yeah. the translator came up to me afterwards and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm waiting for translation. He says, don't do that. He says, I interpret right away. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. the next presentations, I figured that out. Now, the, the interesting part about that scenario was um, I incorporated a little humor, and I had to do a little background research in Iran. Yeah. And so I uh, did some research on history, politics, a bunch of different things, and incorporated that in my presentation. And one of my marketing presentations is I had talked about the impact of of visuals and impact of messages in marketing uh, and how they, in many places, they were uh, consistent or, or uh, common in different cultures. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I talked about was the interpretation of color and how it influences our buying decisions. And I found out before I went there that the opposing party to the current political party, and they just had an election, their uh, campaign colors were green. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I was speaking, I had talked about the color ranges and what they did and impact on me messaging. And I said, I understand in Iran that uh, green has a special meaning. And of course, the audience went wild. They started laughing and clapping mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And uh, at that point, when I was being, the translation was happening, I paused because humor, you need 
need a bit yeah, of a yeah, bond. Yeah, yeah. So, and the interpreter came up to me afterwards and he says, that was brilliant. Love the, love the humor. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, thank you for spending time talking to me about your culture because it mm -hmm. really helped me understand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where I was speaking. Yeah. So I've had the opportunity around uh, over the years to speak in a bunch of different countries. Yeah, yeah. I was going to, yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, you mentioned uh, live translation, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say, you know, you arrived when what you say is important enough to be translated into multiple languages live. <laughs> well, and the interesting part uh, in Iran, the uh, most of the people are, and I shouldn't say most, I'd say probably about three quarters of the audience mm -hmm. understood English. Okay. And so the translation for the, was for those that had a problem interpreting English, but could understand a bit of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, also, what I know is, um, there's the understanding English, and then there's the actually absorbing it emotionally, right? For example, when you talk to some, uh, uh, for example, when I hear in the Vietnamese community, when I talk to some people, it, maybe some of them, they would understand the English language and whatnot, but it doesn't resonate with them quite the same way as if it was, um, you know, Vietnamese that I would speak to them in, right? There's that connection that occurs, right? So, so comprehension, comprehension is, is not only uh, words, uh, comprehension is in fact, uh, you know, the, that specific word in that specific language, uh, in that, the way it specifically sound, you connect them in, in a different way, I think. Yeah, interesting enough, uh, speaking of Vietnamese, uh, mm -hmm. when I, moved to Edmonton, uh, I was fortunate enough, a friend of mine introduced me to a Vietnamese uh, guy in Edmonton, because mm -hmm. uh, my buddy had said to me, he says, you know, you're under a lot of stress in this agency world. And he says, I can see the stress starting to get to you a bit. And you've always talked about martial arts. Mm -hmm. He said, would you like to learn from somebody who, you know, is teaching martial arts? And I said, absolutely. What mm -hmm. does he teach? Well, he taught Win Chung, which is the same style as Bruce Lee. Mm. So I remember when I met him, and he was from Vietnam. He was he was one of the people that came over during the war, much yeah. like you did, mm -hmm. and landed here in Canada, not not speaking much English at all. Right. And when I met him, he was he was starting to really become more fluent in English. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we we met. Um, he became my my uh, instructor. I was his only student for five uh, no eight years. Wow. And uh, so we worked one on one, and it was funny because you're talking about the translation. Well, we'd be we'd be working out, and he would he would talk to me using Vietnamese words for different parts of the body, so mm -hmm. phuc sao, tan sao, ji sao, so on and so forth. And and this was the instructions he'd give me. And once in a while he'd mix it up. He'd say, you know, in English, he'd say, "Kick me with your fist," mm -hmm. and I'd stop for a second and he'd laugh, and I go, "Oh, yeah, I know what you mean." <laughs> so, so it was entertaining you know many times uh, you know we spent quite a, a bit of time together of course training one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end uh, I was selling my business I was moving to Calgary mm -hmm. and just because of his ability to teach me the martial art I got to a, a point where I was able to spar with him one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and manage to keep up but wow. near the end a couple of times I clipped him and he looked at me and he says David he says, control your punch. Every time you come here, I get souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> funny, and funny he'd guy. Smile, right? He'd smile. <laughs> funny guy, funny guy. Um, yeah. I see you with your uh, special buddies here in caps. Yeah, well, funny enough, that was in New Zealand. I spoke in New Zealand twice. I was uh, invited to speak at their convention, but I also spoke at a sales conference in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, so the guy in the middle is Kit Grant, one of the... Uh, uh, I'd say oldest members, and I'm sure if he's listening, he'll give me a hard time about that, but he's one of the oldest members within CAPS. Uh, he was there when he and I were first members of the association. The guy on the right is Lindsay Adams, and he was from Australia. Uh, he went on to be the president of the Australian Association and eventually the International Federation president. So yeah. this is us uh, much younger. This is mm -hmm. back in the early 2000s, and I spoke in New Zealand uh, several times. Yeah. Uh, and interesting enough, I was invited to speak in New Zealand because I'd introduced technology and multimedia to speakers back in 1996. Mm -hmm. And many of them 
have hated me ever since because mm -hmm. <laughs> it was something they didn't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I built built quite a business up out of that, just uh, teaching speakers and business people how to use multimedia and do presentations. Mm -hmm. Hey, David, I, I think the sound, uh, the, the notification sound comes from your computer. I don't know um, what you have running that might be doing that. Uh, that sound is okay, but if you have some other uh, sort of sounds coming in, um, that, that's probably coming from the same uh, same device there. But uh, Oh, I'll bet you it's the, just the uh, motor on the computer. Yeah, how's that sound now? Uh, no, what I mean is, is uh, every so often we would hear a ding, like a you got mail kind of a sound. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So you might have some other software running that has notification turned on. Uh, no, that's what it was. It was mail. I apologize for that. You bet. So, so <laughs> that's what I thought. It sounded like a you got mail kind of a thing, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, cool, cool. Uh, let me uh, maybe go to the next video uh, photo here. This is again probably in Iran again, right? It is, yeah. That that was uh, one of the audiences. That was in uh, the capital city, Tehran, mm -hmm. or Tehran, and um, there was, uh, I think, twelve hundred uh, people in the audience. So you can see that all of the mix of, of people in the audience there, mostly people that were in business, but there were some very large companies there as well. Uh, there were some representatives of um, also the competitive airline to the national airline. So. Yeah. But we had the entire management team as part of our, our session. It was interesting because when you speak in, in Iran, what happens typically because you're a teacher as such, mm -hmm. um, you're very, in very high regard. And it was the first time that I'd ever been literally swamped by people coming up wanting a photograph and an autograph. <laughs> and they were all pushing in to try and get towards me. And I, I said to one of my speaker friends that was there with me, I said, now I know what the Rolling Stones feel like when they get swamped <laughs> by a crowd. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but interesting enough, we had to head to another city mm -hmm. and because the crowd kept uh, coming around and, and wanting to uh, interact with us, we were in a position of missing the, the flight. Mm. Um, so because the uh, next place we were going to, the executive of the airlines was also going to be part of the air the uh, audience, the organizer of the convention called the senior VP of operations and said, look, we're not going to make the, we're not going to make the flight. We're too late. Mm -hmm. And it, can you do anything? And this is the first time and probably the only time ever in my speaking career, they actually held up a national airline for us to arrive at the airport because we were speaking to the the airline staff at the next convention. <laughs> there so, you go. Yeah, they held it up by about 20 minutes, half an hour. Yeah, yeah. We came running in the airport, went through two checkouts uh -huh. or two, two luggage checks, yeah. and onto the plane in less than 15 minutes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite an experience, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to ask you. Uh, you know that that previous photo inspired me to ask you. So when you speak internationally, some, you know seemingly and, and, and rightly so quite uh, a different location and, and very different uh, many many differences such as iran tell me though what is one similarity between iran and, and north america here that that you might want point out and say you know that particular aspect is exactly like here can you think of a top of mind sort of aspect that that in iran in the short time that you've been there uh, is kind of like here yeah yeah interesting enough in the 80s, 70s and 80s, and uh, in Iran, uh, what happened was um, they were very influenced by the American culture. Mm -hmm. So a lot of their marketing and a lot of their thinking around communications was very Americanized. And, and of mm -hmm. course, after the civil wars there, uh, it, a lot of the elders were killed off in the revolution. Mm -hmm. And so their audience is very young. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the organizer said to me is he said, these are, these are, we're talking the average age being in the 30 to 40 year old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are business owners right. and they want to learn about how to do business. So mm -hmm. they were very welcoming of, of being able to talk about, you know, how to market in an international world mm -hmm. and how to build their business. So it was, it was quite interesting to see yeah. and, and just incredible people, very hospitable, very personable, very friendly. So, Despite mm -hmm. everything that was going on in the world, um, yeah, yeah. I was quite pleasantly surprised and treated very well the whole yeah. time I was there. Yeah, quite yeah. fascinating. In other words, uh, 
uh, people are different uh, throughout the world, but people are also the same in many ways. So, so you know, depends, people people. yeah, depends on what you look for. If you look for differences, you see them. If you look for similarity, you, you see them as well. Yeah, exactly. Who are these fine gentlemen? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, um, as I mentioned, I was a, a member of the Chamber of Commerce for a number of years. I also ran to the largest committees of the chamber, but I was invited to speak to one of the business groups uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, and I found out that the other two people who were going to speak, be speaking the same day was uh, Mayor Dave Bronconye of Calgary at the time, and Ken King, the uh, former chair of the Calgary Flames. Mm -hmm. And of course, the fellow on the very far right is the chamber manager at the time. So mm -hmm. I was very uh, pleased and, and a little bit uh, overwhelmed with the fact of who else was going to be sharing the platform at that particular event. Yeah, yeah, it was a, uh... there you go with your uh, education, yeah, international, ran... international education delivery. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I should correct myself. I said Iran, it's Iran. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. You yeah. know, there's, there's a burden of knowledge. Um, for those who know more, we expect more, right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, I, I wouldn't know. I, I, if you didn't mention it, I, I this is the first time. So I'm learning that. I've learned that now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, we've seen that picture already. Sorry, cool. there's some people get, yeah. There you Same go. Yeah. Oh, hold on. So that's uh, that's when I spoke to the uh, sales organization in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called SWAP, sales sales with a purpose. Is it true that New Zealand has a lot of similarities to Canada? Yeah, New Zealand is very much like Canada, and Australia is more like the U.S. Oh, really? I, so, I did not know that about Australia. I knew, I knew, I heard about New Zealand being similar to Canada in many ways. I have not heard about the U.S. Uh, Australia. Cool. Yeah, and and New Zealand's quite interesting because the North Island's more tropical. The South Island is more kind of a Canadian landscape. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, so this this is uh, basically a model I use for talking about the marketing process and. And so I was speaking to a bunch of other speakers, actually, about the whole world of marketing today and how we have uh, the two two aspects to our, our uh, building client relationships. One is the sales process. The other one is marketing, and it has to work cohesively. Both mm -hmm. things have to happen. And so building brand recognition in the market can no, no longer just be a cold call or a sales call, nor can it just be going online and posting stuff on social media. We have to have a, a consistent approach between those two aspects of our communication to be able to attract customers and retain clients. Right. I, I see your company name just in the background here, just behind your arm there, but I also see the smaller font there. It's uh, Spark Spark Communication Inc. Uh, so uh, yes. for those folks who are watching, it's uh, S-P-A-R-K Communications Inc. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Here you are. And uh, uh, what is that place? Tell us, can you, um, tell us, uh, looks like. Yeah, that was a, a secondary session I did at that uh, not-for-profit uh, event. Mm -hmm. So I ran two sessions that, at that point. Hey, you have plenty of flip charts up there, my friend. Did you use any of those that session or were you beyond flip chart at this point? <laughs> uh, that was actually for one of the other speakers. So they <laughs> staged the uh, event back to back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, I don't do use flip chart as much as some other people. And I find myself, um, uh, I mean, once in a while I use them, but, but some people use them a lot. Some use them all day, every day kind of thing. But, uh, well, the danger danger with that is is that if you're writing on the flip chart and you're not writing large enough, half your audience is not going to see what you're writing, and I've seen that so often. Yeah. Or you get some writers there; uh, they write like a uh, prescription. You yeah. can't read it, and you can't tell what they're writing. Yeah, so that's yeah. why I use multimedia is is because when you put it up on the screen, 
hopefully everybody can see what you're presenting. Yeah, I mean, that's why when I view a flip chart, it's almost always um, for exercises where, where each group has a flip chart. And uh, I might have one in the front as well, and I might have somebody helping me sort of work it out while the rest. Um, but but for my own, uh, I typically don't use a lot of flip charts ever. But uh, well, and cool. it's different whether you're doing a keynote or a workshop or a seminar. The the format is different. You bet, you bet. So I believe that was the last photo in this particular series here. Oh, there's always a surprise when you pop them up because we didn't uh, put them in any particular order. <laughs> So you're testing my ability to uh, talk on the fly. So doing interesting enough uh, when it came to yeah. different business models and different approaches in the market. When I first started out in the speaking business, I was primarily a trainer. Mm. And, uh, Quite interesting enough, about oh, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I wound up doing or starting doing more keynotes. And now 90% mm -hmm. of my business has been keynotes in the speaking world. And occasionally I'll get a client where I'll do a, an ongoing training program for them as a result of them hearing my keynote. Yeah. But uh, funny enough, back when the keynotes started happening, one of my speaker buddies looked at my business card and said, well, no wonder you're getting more keynotes. And I said, why is that? And mm. I looked at my card and I had a tuxedo on. <laughs> well, sure enough, I wound up getting booked for more keynotes. So. You, you got to look the part. You got to look the part, right? Yeah. yeah if exactly. you're going to play in a rock band, uh, you're going to play in a rock band, you got to look like a rock band member, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, nowadays, if you look at most rock, rock musicians from the 70s, they're like me. They haven't got much hair left. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you a quick rock story, though. So you know that Caps uh, band that that uh, uh, I belong yeah. to that did that uh, thing, uh, Elevation, uh, right, with Barry Lewis yeah. Green. And, that was uh, excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we did that. And uh, I remember coming down from the, the, the stage after a set and, and one fairly respectable musician in the, um, in the audience there immediately um, came up to me and said, hey, Dune, you, you play like a rock star, but you look like an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I, I shared that with my social media kind of post, and I said, you know, uh, I, I need to reconcile those two things. So do you have any uh, tips or ideas on how to reconcile this? So, you know, I, I want to uh, learn how to play like an accountant so that uh, it would be, you know, Kind of fully reconcile, but but that's what he said to me. You play like a rock star, but you look like an accountant. I said, oh, okay. Thank well, you. it's funny over the years because I was so business oriented. Like I was one of the few guys in the advertising business in my early career that I actually wore a suit and tie. Mm. Most creative people in the business wore a t-shirt and jeans, and I remember several of my clients, and one in particular, which worked with me building the the uh, legal consulting side of our business. Mm -hmm. uh, came to me and he said, um, I, I asked him one day, I said, why'd you hire me? Or why'd mm -hmm. you come to me to, to work together? And he said, because you're one of the few creative people I know who actually has a business mindset. He says, I've talked to your peers. I've talked to your competition. I've talked to your clients. And they all say the same thing. And I said, that was one of the best compliments I'd ever had in my career early on was to recognize that, yeah, I'm here for business. The creative side just happens to be one of the tools in the toolkit. You are in the creative business, but not a, a right? Yeah. Cool. cool. So, so the, uh, I'm going to share some uh, photos of um, your books. You've written a few books. And, and so tell us about that while I uh, prep that here for, for our viewers, my friend. Well, early on in my career, I actually co-authored some books. So they're not totally my content. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first ones that, uh, that I co-authored was actually with a number of speakers from the U.S. and uh, I think one from Australia, and I was the only Canadian mm. in, in that uh, series. And, and I'd run into one of the um, editors who started that book uh, mm -hmm. at one of the NSA conventions in the state, States long before CAP started, and mm -hmm. he approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in contributing. Mm -hmm. So that's the book called uh, Sale, uh, Customer Service Goldmine. That was the first book I co-authored. And then the second book that I co-authored was called Sales Gurus Speak Out. Mm -hmm. And that was with a number of Canadian people who were 
in the sales training and sales speaking business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and more recently, um, I've just launched a, another book called uh, Ignite uh, Innovative Sales, or no, Spark Innovative Sales Marketing Stra and, uh, Marketing Strategies, I think is the, the current title. I have to look at it myself because it's been a while since I created the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to bring it up, but for whatever reason, it's not opening the... Uh, one of the photo opened just fine. The other two don't want to open. So I just came back. Right, right. Let me just come back in here and see if I can uh, make it happen here. So, uh, sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so uh, tell, tell us about the book writing journey. What did you find? Uh, any highlights from that? Low lights from that? How did you find uh, writing books? Uh, I wanted to uh, pursue on that, kind of go on that journey myself, but I know it's a lot of work as well. So I haven't uh, invested the time yet. So. Well, and, and funny enough, for many, many years, I had other other things that I'd authored. In fact, when I first got into the, the CAPS organization, I had produced um, CDs with multimedia on them. I produced workbooks, um, a, a bunch of things like that. But I was always reluctant to uh, write a book. And in yeah. fact, I've got several of my buddies, one of them you know well in, in Edmonton, Bob Huey, has been on my case for many, many years to write books. Yeah, there's and a man who I, wrote probably, he probably wrote uh, 60 books or something silly like that, right? <laughs> so some number, well, you know, I don't yeah. know how many, but you know what I mean. Yeah, so over the years, I've created articles, I've done blogs. I, I had blogs that I sent out uh, early 2000s, or uh, I should say e-newsletters, we were calling them at those days. And so I had lots of articles and so on. And my biggest challenge, and probably a challenge that a lot of speakers have, is narrowing down what I speak on into something that can be put into a book size that's digestible and uh, easy to read. And it's quite a process. I, the, the one book that I co-authored, I actually, uh, that one I've, I've got content in there primarily related to my coaching business. So, but with the sales guru book, I had actually sat down, I was supposed to do a chapter in the book, sat down and wrote and just wrote and s looked at my writing and realized that I'd, written about half a book at that point. And I was only supposed to write a 10 page chapter. So I <laughs> sent it off to the editor and I said, can you do something with this? And she she came back and she said, well, there could be several chapters, but we've only got a slot in the book for one. Yeah. So she yeah. edited it down and put it into the book. So yeah. I, th I think the hardest part in the, in the whole writing business, particularly writing books, is there's the creative mode, which is just dumping ideas on paper. Yeah. And most of us, when we're in the creative mode, and this this happens, I, I talk to people about creativity. This happens with the whole creative process is we're automatically trying to edit while we're writing. Mm, yeah. And that stops the creative process dead. Mm -hmm. So the hardest challenge for most people who are writers, particularly if you have an analytical mindset, mm -hmm. is we want to write and edit at the same time. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. I found the best way was dump the ideas down, go back, cut and paste. I literally took articles, I wrote them out, and then I took a pair of scissors and tape and cut them apart and repasted them together because on a computer scene, screen, you can't see the whole article. Mm. So I found for me that was the best way to be able to write was just dump the information down, print it out, cut it apart, put it back together, and, and then uh, do it that way. So if, if I was to give any advice, and I'm not the world's most prolific author, as you can probably tell, uh, any advice to anybody thinking about writing a book is just write. Yeah. Put the information down. Don't stop. Don't think about it. Don't edit. And then go back and visit it and reorganize it and edit at that point. And yeah. get somebody else to read it over and, and provide edits, uh, yeah. edits to you. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that very much. And, and when I teach, uh, uh, you know, analytical thinking and when I teach uh, – management and collaboration, uh, I really talk about the same concept. The, the, the idea is that there's power in focus. And there's also, you know, you got to think that, uh, you know, oil that we or the gasoline that we put in our car wasn't done by one step by one company. It, you know, we get gasoline in our car uh, because it had gone through many, many different companies who upgraded and refined it and whatever. I don't know oil and gas business enough to know all the different steps and, and what to properly call them. But but I would imagine that, that there are many different companies that, that, you know, obviously drilling it and get it out of the ground and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Right. So so uh, the same is 
true about anything that's complex, such as uh, writing a book. If you want to make it so that it's um, is robust, you have to say, here's a process. Uh, I'm not at the refining uh, refinement process. I'm actually at the drilling process. So you just focus on drilling, focus on drilling. And eventually when you're done with that, you just know that it needs to go through another step, whatever that is. And it might be best done by someone else rather than yourself. In other words, one company doesn't do everything necessary to get uh, oil from the ground into you know your vehicle as gasoline, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and another tip that I got from some fairly prolific writers and, and people who had been writing for a long, long time was put together a series of folders. And, and mm. most books are like 10 chapters. Some are more chapters, some are less. But put together a series of folders, and every time you come up with a different thought that needs to go into the book, put that into a folder. And then every time you collect information or research and so on, put those into the individual folders folders related to those chapters. So that when you come back to writing, you pull out one folder that has a chapter in it and you write and you use the research and the information you have in that folder, then you move to the next one. Yeah. So that, that was a brilliant uh, thought on, on writing that I had heard. And to this day, I don't remember which writer, if not many writers had told me that. Yeah. In other words, creativity, there is a process that can support creativity. Creativity is not just completely random. Uh, you should be able to think about your discipline, whether it's music or whether it's playing guitar, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a symphony orchestra. You always need to say, you know, here are the parts that needs to be kind of process driven and, and we, we put structure to it. And here are the parts that can be creative within those process and structures that we put in place, right? So the whole kind yeah. of strategic decision about what is creative and what is very much uh, science. Exactly. You know, and interesting enough, when I was in the advertising business, one of the ways that we developed to campaign concepts, creativity, mm -hmm. was to uh, do what we call thumbnails. So mm -hmm. literally small, little uh, sketches and they would be a combination of a visual mm -hmm. and then oftentimes we put notes on the side of the visual so a little you know three by two by three sketch very rough oftentimes stick figures we put a note beside it as to what the headline might be and some direction as to what the image was about and so on and the same thing was true with uh, doing uh, television commercials is we do a sketch of the process of what the commercial would look like frame by frame or theme by theme. And then we'd also write underneath, uh, if we had a, a, an actor speaking, uh, what they might say, the uh, movement in the scene, and then also any sort of animation that would happen and so on, we'd put that underneath the sketches and then take a look at the flow of the campaign. So I got very used to uh, doing both at the same time where I'd sketch and then I'd write. And uh, in a very quick time, I could come up with 20, 30 different sort of concepts for a campaign. And, and as you know, in the advertising industry, it's, it's a, a very competitive industry and we're always focused on deadlines. So it was creativity under pressure and literally you had to deliver every hour, every day to be able to meet deadlines. So it became a very prolific process. And that's one of the things I taught other people when I spoke uh, in my, or when I still speak, um, I talk about creativity and innovation and the difference between the two. Yeah, you bet. And, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's really resonate with me in terms of the, uh, really marrying the, uh, the creativity w with the science, you know, the whole science and art that they really need to work in, in a symbiotic kind of relationship. But uh, tell us about some of these uh, wine related photos, perhaps. Well, actually, that's not a wine-related photo. That's a uh, that's the first Caps convention in but Canada. But I'm sure there were wine there. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they did have some wine shortly shortly after that. But uh, uh, it was the first Caps convention we ran in Toronto, and uh, uh, I've forgotten Terry's last name. He's on the left. He was the national president in the United States, NSA, uh -huh. um, and Peter next to him was one of the longest term members in Toronto, yeah. the guy in the middle, you might recognize. Absolutely. Uh, hmm? Absolutely. I'm sure our viewers would all recognize the gentleman in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, uh, a comic and also uh, I've forgotten the television show and radio show. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God. 
First name's David. Mm -hmm. Lightfoot. Uh, Broadfoot. David Broadfoot. Broadfoot. Sorry. Yeah. 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 And uh, so he ran a a long-term CBC uh, comedy show on radio and also did some television work. So they had invited him to speak at the first national CAPS convention, and I had the great pleasure of introducing him. Mm -hmm. So quite interesting. Uh, He had quite a, a long career before this convention. And so I asked his secretary to send me a, an introduction, and she sent me a five-page resume. Mm. <laughs> and so I had to decipher that, turn it into an ad- introduction for David. And uh, after I finished introducing him, he got up on the stage. And I, when I introduced him, I said, my dad was a big fan of yours mm. for many, many years. They used to have the uh, show playing in the office where my dad was an architect, so he and his partner would play the CBC radio all day. And of course the comedy show would come on and they'd be listening to that. And so I said, I'm quite familiar with that. And when David got up on stage, uh, he laughed and he says, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. How old is your dad? (laughs) (laughs) So we had a good chuckle over that and and got to know each other a bit during convention. The guy next to him, you might recognize that's Brian Lee. Lee, of course. Yeah. 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 So I've known Brian, Brian Lee, brother. whose brother is Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and not the martial arts guy. Not the martial arts guy. Yeah. So Brian and Bruce, I've known from JC days back when I took the effective speaking program in the 80s. Yeah. 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 So there's a wine tasting photo. <laughs> All right, there so, uh, like I say, when I was uh, running the wine import business, um, I also did uh, quite a number of wine tastings. And so you can see the products in the, the foreground there and me standing with a glass and I was presenting to people. This was actually supporters of the arts community. So they had put on a fundraising event. So you guys were, uh, you guys are, uh, started with professional speaking uh, as a professional speaker long before I was even, uh, uh, you know, in Canada and learning any uh, English. As a, you know, I, I probably didn't know a word of English when you guys were flying around um, other continents and sharing <laughs> your ideas and uh, being translated into other languages simultaneously. So that's that's the Italian wine tasting. Didn't realize there was a couple of those pictures in there. You can yeah, see me yeah. speaking. In- that's probably, that's probably what what uh, caused me to think these were wine photos. But uh, cool. So we got a, a mixture of wine and uh, you know speaking and uh, caps and whatnot. But uh, tell us uh, motorcycle. Tell us about this motorcycle thing. How long have you been riding motorcycle? And now you're the was it? The, if I heard correctly, the president of the. Uh, well, I, I won't. I don't want to get it wrong. So go ahead and tell us that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny, as a kid, when I was growing up, I was told no motorcycles, nobody <laughs> in the family will ride a motorcycle. And of course, being a good uh, son, uh, I didn't ride a motorcycle. And about, uh, oh God, when was that? Early tw- uh, 2000s, a buddy of mine called me up, a guy I knew in high school, I'd lost track of for many, many years. And his name was Dave as well. We both played in the band. He played bass. I played guitar. Anyway, he called me up and he says, I'm back in Calgary. Uh, He lived in the States for a long time, Ottawa and so on. Called me up and he said, let's get together. And he started talking. He says, well, I'm I'm doing this thing with a motorcycle ride for dad. And he said, "Uh, would you be interested in helping us out? And I went, boy, that's cool. I'd love to be able to ride a motorcycle because I never did get a chance when I was younger. So in the early 2000s, I picked up motorcycle riding. I took a course and the next thing I know is on the committee helping them raise funds and uh, help organizing the events. Uh, so it's been 13 years I've been involved with a motorcycle ride for Dad in Calgary. And uh, we've raised a, a million and a half just in the Calgary area and over $33 million Canada-wide for prostate cancer and research, um, uh, research and awareness, I should say. So that's the purpose of the ride, but it's, it's just a hoot. I've had uh, two different motorcycles so far and uh, looking at getting another one. So it's uh, it's great fun. We uh, have a parade style uh, event and then wind up uh, doing some highway riding, end up with a barbecue at the end. This year, although uh, because of COVID, we're, we're not doing the ride uh, at the same time. It's usually around Father's Day weekend. Mm-hmm. So this year we're looking at September to possibly do the ride, but uh, 
Yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's been a pleasure. Interesting enough, back in my childhood or in my teen years, uh, my next door neighbor had a Honda 450 and he put me on as a passenger. We took off into the countryside and at uh, 80 miles an hour, he dumped the bike and oh, I no. wound up uh, blowing off the bike, doing a tuck and roll and got up and <laughs> was looking for body parts missing. But fortunately, oh. I, was, I was in pretty good shape and nothing hurt. And yeah. looked at him, and he'd scratched up his knuckles. And I stood up, and I went, wow, that was close. And wow. he said, well, a little closer than you'd like to think, take your helmet off. And I'd sheared the top of my helmet off. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when I first went and took my motorcycle training uh, courses, I wasn't leaning into my turn because I figured I was going to blow off the bike. And the instructor uh -huh. comes over, and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, you're supposed to lean in the turn. Said, well, you're gun shy a little bit. Yeah, I told him the story, and, and he looked at me, and he says, oh, okay, I get what's going on. And he says, don't worry, you're not going to fall over. And I said, are you going to guarantee that? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so from then on, I, I gained a love for riding motorcycle. Uh, cool story. You know, I started uh, with my motorcycles back when I was uh, in grade 10, I think it was. For me, it was the, the only transportation I could afford. You know, I could not afford four wheels, but for two wheels, I could manage uh, the payment. And uh, so I got <laughs> uh, my was that was that in vietnam no i was actually in canada, oh, it was canada. Yeah. i'll tell you a quick story um you know back in those days especially when you live in a, a sort of a small town westlock uh, transportation is very precious right so so you know here's what it was for me the day i turned 16 I had walked my Honda CB550 to the examiner's office, to the, the provincial law court, where we would take the exam. And if I failed the exam, I had to walk at home on the day of my birthday. I could not wait until the day after. So prior to that, I was practicing and, you know, kind of uh, learning the whole handling of the motorcycle in a, uh, what was the, a lumber yard of a, uh, you know, Westlock building supplies, right? And so we so oh, yeah. would do that in there. Uh, so that you know on the day of my birthday i walked the motorcycle out so anyway we had a, i had a few motorcycles but uh, when i had enough money to buy a car i did and uh, you know being kind of quote unquote safety conscious i i sort of put that behind me but as you know you get to keep your um, you know drivers um, we're at class six or whatever it is they give you uh, forever right so uh, i can still ride a motorcycle today legally if um, if i uh, wanted to yeah yeah mm. uh, uh, I'm just going to bring in some photos here. Just reminisce a bit. Uh, oh. Reminisce a bit. Tell us about uh, maybe a story that comes uh, with the photo that's on here. Uh, here you are with one of your. Is it a Harley? No, actually, it's a it's a Kawasaki Vulcan, uh, is what it's called. So oh, cool. that was my second bike. It was a little larger than the first one. The first one I had was a Suzuki. I think it was 1100 cc bike. This one's 1500. So oh, that was the first time I did any long. Uh, travel routes and, and yeah. Uh, so yeah so you know this was uh, 1985 or so 1985 right 1985 I remember a, a, a 650 I had a Yamaha 650 uh, uh, it wasn't a Virago oh was it Virago uh, but anyway 650 seems big back then remember those days 650 oh, yeah. a big bike these days 650 is like a toy yeah <laughs> well it's like a scooter <laughs> exactly, so yeah, souped up scooter. Nice scooter you got there. Uh, yeah, I, I, my, my 550 was huge. It was like a police, it was just like a police uh, kind of um, mm -hmm. motorcycle, right? With those pipes that goes out to the side and, and just, if you lay it on the side, nothing would be scratched because that 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 uh, engine protector was so big, right? And, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it was huge, <laughs> it was huge for a 550. Yeah, well this bike was I think 850 pounds, so. Yeah. Bike. That's uh, we uh, with the motorcycle ride for dad. In fact, in the picture, you'll see me in the red shirt at the back. Mm -hmm. Standing beside me is the guy that introduced me to motorcycle riding and my high school buddy, Dave. Mm. So with the white beard. Mm. There you go. <laughs> but the, uh, you see the man van in the background. And so one of the things we do with the fundraising we do is we support the man van and it does on-site testing. Mm -hmm. um, it's called a PSA test, which many of you have probably had, so yeah. not the rubber glove test. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we support that by funding it uh, to show up on different sites and yeah. and providing uh, free testing for men, men over cool. 45. Cool. And that's me on the left there on the black bike. Uh -huh. um, and uh, 
the fellow in the foreground there is our what we call our ride captain. So okay. he's a um, he's the former trainer for the RCMP and the sheriffs, motorcycle mm -hmm. trainer, mm -hmm. and uh, he's on our committee. Uh, so he, every year he leads our parade, and um, it's it's been great getting to know him because learn a lot about riding. And so that's me on the left hand side there. I'm riding a top of the line Harley which was supplied to me as the chair of the Calgary chapter uh, for the uh, actual ride itself. And that came from Kane's Harley in Calgary. So uh, great bike. I'll tell you, it was uh, my, one of my buddies that was on the ride with me, looked at me, he says, you know, the whole time you ate that, mm -hmm. or the whole time you uh, uh, rode that, he says, you had a, a grin from ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, fun. Harley and the top of the line Harley who wouldn't be look at it looks awesome Not awesome <laughs> So that was our parade in 2019 you can see the formation there. Yeah, we had cool. uh, 300 riders. Wow our big, Biggest ride was 650. Yeah, yeah, yeah Yeah, so this this is just our wrap-up party afterwards So uh, in that photo you'll see me on the left in the middle is one of our uh, top sponsors That's the president of blue circle insurance his name's mm. Jerry. Next to him is um, our former chair before I was chair. And beside him is the uh, head of the TELUS volunteer uh, department. And so he organizes all of the volunteers that help us out on our ride. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty phenomenal ride. And we've, like I say, we've had as many as 650 riders. There was uh, as many as 72 volunteers for mm -hmm. the event. Now, how many years have you been uh, in that role of uh, chair or president of this uh, motorcycle ride for dad? Uh, it's just my second year. Cool. Wonderful. Chair. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's the same picture there. Just to, yeah. So you can see the collection of bikes there. We had everything from uh, <laughs> what what's typically known as a crotch rocket to uh, full-size touring bikes, Harleys and so on. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Um, well, wonderful. Uh, so, so, David, when, when you think about uh, all of the different things that you've done with uh, your your career and your business and your um, kind of uh, recreation and, and charity and, and serving the community and whatnot, uh, tell us, uh, what does the next five year looking like? I, I, I'm assuming you're not retiring anytime soon. So, so what does the next five years look like for you as you sort of project yourself out beyond COVID? Well, you're right about the retiring. I was talking to one of the other fellows as part of our, our coaching organization uh, last week. And I said, well, I think I plan on retiring by age 75, but I don't know about this COVID situation, what that's going to do. Mm. But, um, you know, I love what I do. So I, I don't really, in many days, I don't see it as work. Mm. Although I have to say this last couple of years since 20, well, probably 2015 with the big dip in 2018. Yeah. And now this COVID thing. Um, it's it's more challenging than ever to be in business, and and uh, as you as you age, as you probably know, doing it becomes tougher to have the energy and the enthusiasm. But I'm I'm hoping uh, uh, to carry on and and keep speaking, keep coaching, keep training, um, do consulting, and so on. And uh, you know, one of my inspirations and and one of the first people that ever encouraged me to get into the speaking business. Uh, was Art Linkletter. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know that name or not. But, I, do, uh, I do, of course. Uh, uh, he so legend, legend. Legend. Yeah. yeah. So he came out when I was in the public speaking program with the JCs. He came out and did a, uh, an event with us. I was the one of the organizers on the committee. We did a thing called the Our Power Rally. So we had six NSA speakers uh, out to that event. He was one of them. And then he did a special session for a bunch of us on the committee after and uh, we chatted afterwards, and, and he said, you know, you should really think about public speaking. This is mm -hmm. in 1983. Mm -hmm. And many years later, when the NSA was going, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Cavett Roberts, who was the founder of, of the National Speakers Association, and I had quite a, a great chat with him at the convention. And, and uh, he was a real um, encouragement because he was still speaking at 87 years old. Mm, oh wow! But uh, great storyteller, great presenter, and and like I say, the founder of NSA. So it's just seeing people like that still going and speaking at that age, and I'm thinking, well, 
as long as I'm still mobile and still uh, functioning mentally, uh, I'm hoping I can still do the same thing as I as I get older. Well, with the technology that we are uh, learning these days, mobile is not even that big of a deal anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Yeah, exactly. no, flight, no flights to catch, no uh, check-in, no security. Uh, so um, just tell us briefly about this uh, YouTube uh, website that you have out there. Uh, I'm sure you'll uh, have uh, more and more content here in the long run, but many of your contents are actually sort of in the uh, private area that you referred to earlier, the membership site that uh, people who are a member subscribe and whatnot are in there. But this is just a public facing sort of out there um, kind of accessible. Uh, yeah, I have my own channel. I have my own uh, YouTube channel, and it's uh, it's just David Saxby Speaker. So people can go in there. Most of the presentations, uh, uh, you know, the on the left hand side are, are workshop sort of environments or seminars. The uh, right hand side there are more of my keynote presentations, particularly the keynotes on innovation. Yeah. And so a lot of the workshops are more on the sales and marketing side, and the keynotes. Yeah, although I do talk about communications and I talk about sales and marketing in my innovation speech. It's more about giving people the keys to how to be more innovative in their business. So people are welcome to go there and have a look at the various videos. I have to say one of the, uh, the biggest challenges I've had in the speaking business is getting a good video. Mm -hmm. I've had so many that have gone wrong or not recorded or sound didn't happen. And so uh, that's been one of the biggest challenges I've ever had in the speaking business. Yeah, and of course, uh, but then all of these goofy fun, <laughs> they have good photos of those. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I like having fun in what I do. And even when I speak, I try and as much as possible introduce humor. I'm not a comedian by any means, but I did take some stand-up comedy training. Uh, this is myself and Wayne Lee from Edmonton, along with uh, Derry, our national president in the middle. And this was the 2016 CAPS convention. So the theme of the convention was we are one. So I came up with this idea that we build one huge house coat and we come out on the stage in this house coat. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. That was. Uh... No, that's okay. Go ahead. So that was, that was the theme where all three of us are uh, uh, down to our skivvies in that, uh, <laughs> in that house coat. We walk on the stage together as one. Mm, there you go. And no, you guys got the drink and she did not get one. Yeah. Derry, I would I would go back and do some complaint there. Um, yeah, I don't know if she had well, maybe she has two underneath there. Who knows? Two drinks, maybe. She had to hold the house coat together, otherwise we would have been a <laughs> <laughs> But the other side of it too, the reason Wayne and I are holding cocktails uh -huh. is because when we did the promo video for the Caps convention, we were in the the penthouse suite of the hotel and uh we had talked about you know how leisurely the conference was going to be how much fun it was going to be and so we uh had ordered cocktails and we we're sitting in the literally in the tub at the convention uh penthouse suite yeah. and promoting the convention and then this next photo you're going to show i'll tell you what happened there you go this is the so there's uh wayne myself and sherry who's the uh, executive uh, director of of caps national we love sherry we love sherry she uh yeah. she and her team you know bond uh, association management uh, well they manage many different associations and caps is uh seems to be one of her, her favorites i'm just saying that's just because we're our caps members but she gives us a whole lot of attention doesn't she oh yeah yeah and the interesting part well, that was part of the video shoot we did to promote the convention the entire video was scripted on the spot like we literally made it up as we go. Oh, really? So we had a lot of fun with it. There was a couple of times that we were cracking each other up. And, and uh, of course, so it uh, made the convention fun. It made our, our work on organizing convention a lot of fun. And it was a great convention. Ah, yeah, well, that's fantastic. Now, uh, I want to show some more photos of you in your music and doing your thing. Tell us, uh, so let's... Kind of go back to music again. Tell us a story. Do you have an embarrassing story or an awesome story about music you can share? Or oh, I'm queuing this up here. Well, there's probably lots of them. <laughs> like I say, <laughs> uh, as a as a teenager, um, well, even junior high school, I played in the high school band, and uh, 
I originally wanted to play saxophone because my last mm -hmm. saxophone that made a natural fit. But by the time they got through handing out all the instruments, and because my last name started with S, all oh my left goodness. was a euphonium, which is like <laughs> a tiny tuba. And uh, the instructor of the band handed me the tuba and said, uh, "Okay, here's your instrument." And I took it home and I hated it. I didn't want to play tuba or uh -huh. euphonium. So uh, I went back to him and I said, "I quit. I don't want to play this thing." And he, I said, what else have you got? And he handed me a trombone. I went, nah, I don't know about trombone. Okay, it's kind of cool. It's got a slide. So I uh -huh. went home and practiced and practiced and practiced. And uh, what was interesting was uh, I was in the junior high school band. I made it all the way through high school. And, and that was a course for points. Like you, you got points in your high school credits for being in the band. So it was actually an accredited program. Uh -huh. I made it all the way through junior high school and I got into high school and they had 130 people trying out for the high school band. And so the leader of the band said, well, we got to narrow this down to just enough players to make a band. Mm -hmm. So we had to audition. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so each one of us had to do our audition independently. And so I went into the audition and she sat down and she started putting scales in front of me. <laughs> and so I made it through the first ones because I was quite familiar with those. And by the time we started getting into scales with a lot of sharps and flats, she could tell that I wasn't reading the scale. Mm. She looked at me and she said, okay, she said, here's the deal. She says, I know you don't read music. And I said, what was your first clue? <laughs> 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 and she said, I don't know how you made it this far in band, but she said, you've got a great ear. Uh-huh. She says, here's the deal. If you'll work me, work with me and you'll learn to read music, you're in the band. Mm. So by the time I got to grade 12, uh, I was getting more proficient at playing and also uh, winding up, you know, being able to read music um, and scores. And in fact, when I was in my 11th year of high school, that's when uh, Jesus Christ Superstar came out. Oh, and that I was remember one of the that. we were going to play. And so the, uh, I, I approached the music, the band leader, and I said, uh, could I play guitar instead of trombone for this? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, in high school bands, there's no guitar. Mm. And I said, well, Jesus Christ Superstar has a guitar part. She said, okay, well, if you can play, then you're, you're in the band with uh, playing guitar. There you go. So, uh, so that was one of my embarrassing stories. But uh, the interesting part, too, was we uh, did band tours uh, with other schools. So we'd travel and do a band exchange thing. Yeah. And so we wound up in Trail, BC for one of our band exchanges. And I'm at the school and I'm watching their band perform. In the back of the band is a black guy, black kid. Mm -hmm. The only black guy in the entire band. And he looked exactly like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> and he even played the guitar left-handed like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And so we got chatting afterwards and we both played guitar. In fact, jamming at my place when I was living at home with my parents and got to know the guy fairly well, but it was so funny because everybody was going, Hey, that's Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> and I, saw, I said, no, he looks like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> there you go. Now, did he sound like Jimi Hendrix is another question. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he was a phenomenal guitar player. Yeah. He was an incredible guitar player, and he played Jimi Hendrix just like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. I, I was going to joke and say uh, your story about um, not really wanting to read sheet music or read music and, and wanting to do, play guitar. You know, that's a perfect uh, perfect combination there. Most guitarists that I know prefer to play by ear rather than sheet music and things like that, right? <laughs> well, that's how I started learning guitar is I just turned the radio on and sat down and played. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I didn't know how to, I you know, bass, uh, like trombone is bass clef, right? So I didn't really ever get a chance to read treble clef. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what guitar is, of course. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah anyway, there's uh, Al Barrett, the guy that was making the comment uh, earlier on the Facebook. Yeah, that's him and I in a jam session uh, uh, a few years ago. Yeah, he's on your left or your right. Yeah, that's Al on the left. Okay. He's uh, he's a phenomenal guitarist. Cool. There's usually at the jam session, somebody will come up and say, "Hey, do you know this song?" And you go, "Well, I don't know if I've heard that, but start playing, and I'll catch up." That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Sure enough, he does. Yeah, yeah. 
So that was at the CAPS convention uh, in 2014, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And you guys were on stage, and then they opened it up to kind of a talent night thing. And yeah. I was up there with Chuck yeah. singing away. And Chuck and I were literally in the middle of a song <laughs> when all of a sudden I felt these two hands on my shoulders, and I'm going, okay, who the heck is that? <laughs> and all of a sudden this, this blonde lady comes out front, that's Janice Stanfield. She's from NSA. Her and I met each other back at NSA conventions many years ago, and she does what's called a keynote conference. Mm -hmm. So she came up and she cut in and started singing with us. Yeah. <laughs> great photo. Great photo. You were just, just oh, right into your music there, straight ahead. And uh, uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Chuck and I at the same convention. So that was he and I singing. And then Jenna popped in behind us and surprised the heck out of me. <laughs> yes, Chuck, Chuck Rose uh, was on this, uh, was a guest on this show here uh, a week, uh, probably two weeks ago now. And uh, of course, Chuck is the human, uh, uh, human jukebox, jukebox. Human jukebox <laughs> and, uh, uh, restaurant. Near. Yeah, I, I said to him one day, I said, how many songs do you know? And he says, oh, probably 3,000. That's right. And I said, by memory? And he says, yeah, pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, yeah. And there's another, a few more friends that I recognize here. Yeah, that was uh, actually a, a Scotch and Blues night with a men's group. And uh, Herky was up playing with a guy named Sig Taylor, who's a, a, a counselor and a member of that group. And then you'll notice on the left, the guy sitting down on drums, that's Alvin Law. You bet. The Alvin Law. The Alvin Law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were uh, uh, Sig and Herky were up playing and I came up and I said, do you mind if I sing some tunes? So I wound up spending the better part of uh, probably half an hour with them singing tunes. And Alvin came up and he said, can I sit in on drums? So like I say, there the caption on that picture is the band. Yeah, well, for, the rare, for the rare folks out there who have not seen or heard of uh, Alvin Law or have heard, seen Alvin Law does his thing on stages, uh, Alvin Law was, uh, born and raised with our arms and he's a drummer, he's a trombone player, he's a uh, pianist and uh, you name it. Uh, he does everything that, 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 that I do, uh, you know, at the top level of, of all of those things and uh, awesome, awesome um, individual. And uh, I actually love hugging Alvin and, uh, uh, right, of course, um, his wife as well. And, uh, you know, we see each other at least once, right, at, uh, at CAPS convention and, uh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy, and uh, it always amazes me. Not only does he play drums, he does a little piano playing too. So yeah. when he came up, and I went, I, I was just smiling ear to ear listening to him. So. Yeah, anybody who says you know your fingers a little stubby and a little short for piano, uh, just watch Alvin uh, Law play piano, and and you won't <laughs> you won't complain about your short fingers or stubby fingers anymore. You will make oh, it no. work. You will make it work. <laughs> there's a will, there's a way. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you for sharing those. Um, I, I, I think at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of head towards wrapping it up here. Was there things that you want to share with our viewers that you haven't had the opportunity because of the way we kind of ran it so far, uh, David? Well, you and I were jamming, that's for sure. That's right. <laughs> we were jamming. So we're yeah. having fun and uh, the boss yeah. did not tell us to shut it down. So we kept on jamming. Yeah, and, and it's just great. I mean, first of all, to connect with you again, because we've known each other for a while, and um, we share a lot of common interests, music being one of them for sure. And, you know, I I often wish that I had spent more time in the music world and uh, performing and, and just learning more, and I'm getting back into it now. Uh, you know, as I mentioned to you when we were chatting before we got on onto Facebook here, I spent nine years in musical theater as well. So uh, I started out just coming out for a few bit parts singing and and then wound up uh, several roles in, in musicals and became a, uh, a director, uh, became a producer. I even played uh, in the band for a couple of shows because we had a live band and that was just a blast. Um, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it was, it was a lot of work. We, we had regular rehearsals and we put on four shows a year and uh, it, it just opened up my whole uh, willingness to get back into music. And 
And funny enough, for five years, my sister and I had a band together. So we had 10 people in our band. We performed for a lot of different functions, primarily because of her military background. We performed for military uh, events and that sort of thing, but uh, had a blast doing that. And in the 70s, back back when I was in, in uh, college, I actually uh, had a band up there with several instructors and I was a student there. So we, uh, we got to perform at various events uh, at SAIT. That's where I went to, went to college. And so that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I, I always enjoy incorporating music in my, my life. Unfortunately, sometimes business overwhelms the, uh, the time that I have to, to get back into the whole world of music. And, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would say for all people who are in business, I mean, use all of your skills, incorporate everything you've, you've learned, everything you know, uh, take the take the risk, take the challenge. Uh, definitely look at how you can be more innovative. And uh, you know, there's the upside and the downsides. I, I've been in situations where I could barely scrape together, scrape together a nickel, and just kept pushing and and managed to climb out of a, a real dark, deep, dark hole and get back on track. And so, I'd encourage every business person to just stick to it and keep your Keep your enthusiasm up. Keep your mind focused on innovating your business because uh, it's it's a tough world right now, and we'll make it through. Yeah, it's uh, if you are digging in the right direction, you get there eventually. Just make sure that you aim correctly <laughs> before you put in all the hard work, right? Yeah. Well, sometimes digging winds up in a, a bigger hole, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> Thank you, David, for uh, spending the hour and uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, we, we went over wow. time, my friend, on purpose because I knew that you didn't have a commitment prior to this in terms of client meetings, and I was okay as well. So, uh, so yeah, it's great to hear from you for all the different aspects of your, uh, your life journey so far, my friend. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for the opportunity, and I hope that uh, the people viewing this got some ideas and, and some laughs out of the the time we shared together and um, that was a great jam session, I have to say, dude. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> well, in honor of the jam session theme, I'm going to play the same uh, music that I played at the beginning where you were on vocals. You, you sang this song that was uh, written by, was it written by uh, uh, Jason McCoy, you said? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so funny enough, he's a country guy, but uh, the song is, is more of a rock tune, I think, than country. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, so, so when when we when I take you off the screen, just stay in the green room, which will sort, of, sort of sync up after. But I do want to play some music, uh, kind of to fade us out here. So, so uh, uh, again, thank you so much, David, and uh, thank you to our viewers out there who uh, have watched us live here and then later on in the replay. Um, take good care of yourself, folks. Uh, take good care of one another, uh, and uh, until we meet again, have a wonderful rest of your day. And, and with that, we're going to play that music that you had at the beginning there, beginning there my friend. And we're going to, uh, yeah, kind of fade into it. Fade away. Can you hear the music? <laughs> Can you hear the music? Not yet, no. A world of worry, Here we go. a world of change, a world of lies rearranged, join together in song. We are one, we are one, we have doubts, we have fears, we share the hurt, we share the tears, we are here, we're not alone, we are one, we are one, we are one, we are one.
ease the pain. Stay apart. 